hey, what do you know? What do you know? You know Jesus loves you? What else do you know? That he's faithful? I'll tell you what, sometimes all you need to know is that Jesus loves you, right? Man, I don't know a lot of things, but one thing I know is I know that Jesus loves me. Well, we've been in this series for the last few weeks where we've been talking about things that God wants you to know. Now, there's a verse, and we've not preached on this one, and I'm, I'm not actually preaching about it today. I'm just making a reference to it, where he says this, you will know the truth, and what will the truth do? The truth will, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So how many of you know there's that truth that's there, but if you don't know that truth, that truth isn't going to set you free. So it's not just a matter that there's truth. It's the known truth that sets you free. And in the book of 1 John, he uses the word know 40 times. Now, this is not a very long book, so that is a lot of times for him to say the word. There's some things where he emphasizes, hey, here's some things I really want you to know. This is important stuff. And so he emphasizes this relationship we have with God. And how many of you know when you're confident in that relationship that that's going to bring confidence to your life? Amen? Everybody look here. Okay? When you're confident in your relationship with Christ, that God loves you and you love him, that's going to bring confidence in, in your Christianity. It's going to bring confidence in the way you live your life. There's assurance that's there. And, you know, this confidence that we have in him in this relationship should develop over time in the way we treat each other, right? Because if God is love, God is in us over time. His seed is in us and it should be developing that soon love ought to be marking our lives as well. 1 John 4, 8 says this, whoever does not love, what? Say with me, everybody. Whoever does not love does not know God. So what's he saying here? Is that loving God and knowing God, okay, loving and knowing, they go hand in hand. They go side by side. Now, if we don't love, in essence, what's he saying? If you don't love, then you don't know. If you don't love, then you don't know. And, you know, he wants you to have the assurance of knowing that you know, that there's confidence we have. I like what 1 John 5, 12 says. He says, he who has the Son has life. Would you say that with me? He who has the Son has life life. He has life. You know, our relationship with Christ, that's the crucial connection, right? It's a relationship that's founded in love. That becomes the bedrock. And that relationship becomes kind of the catalyst for the way that we relate to one another. It's our relationship with him that makes it possible for our relationships with each other to thrive. Quite often when we're struggling in our per- interpersonal relationships, there can be something amiss in our relationship with him. It says that we love because why? Because he first loved us. He showed us what love looks like. And uh, I lo- So in other words, the more you know him, the more you're going to become a more loving person. Now, there's, I'm not going to preach on this verse either, but I want to talk with you about it. Go ahead and put this one up here, Russ. It's uh, 1 John 5, 3. Would you say this with me, everybody? We show our love for God by obeying his, and they're not that hard. They're really not that hard to do. So really, what are the commands that he's talking about all through the book of 1 John? We've talked about these. The great commandment. He's saying all of the law, all of the prophets, everything kind of synthesizes down to the great commandment. Where God said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
And he says, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And when we're not loving our brother who we have seen, how can we say we love God whom we haven't seen? And what he's saying is, doing these commands, it's not really that difficult to do. Why? Because when love becomes the foundation for what we do, how many of you know it's a whole lot easier? When you don't like somebody and they're asking you to do something, how motivated are you to do it? Not very motivated. But when you love somebody and you know that they love you and they ask something of you, it's really not that big a deal to do that thing. Why? Because love is the motivation. Love becomes the basis for our relationship. So I want to wrap up here. We're looking at John chapter 5. And then next week, I'm going to pull out some highlights out of these five chapters in 1 John. But today, I want to take a look at three final things that he talks about in this book that God wants you to know. And the first one is this, is that God wants you to know that you are secure in him. Let me hear you say the word secure. You are secure in him. 1 John 5.13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that what? You may know. Know what? That you have eternal life. What's another way we could say this? I write these things so that you may know that you are, that you're saved. Have you ever questioned whether or not you're actually saved or not? Have you ever done that? I, I know I have. How many of you have ever worried about whether you committed the unpardonable sin? Be honest with me. Has anybody ever wondered, did I commit the unpardonable sin? Go to hell. Go directly to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Raise them up high if you've ever wondered if you committed the unpardonable sin. I know I had. Can I just kind of give you, cut you a little bit of slack here? The very, the, the, the fact that you even care whether or not you've committed that sin is evidence that you have not committed that sin. Because ultimately, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit boils down to what? It's, it's having a heart. It's a heart that is so hard that it completely refuses to respond to the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? It's completely unresponsive. Okay? So therefore, if, if you really have committed the unpardonable sin, then your heart simply would not care. You wouldn't care because there's nothing in your heart for God. Are you with me? So the very fact that you've even wondered, have I committed this sin, is indication that, there's, that your heart is sensitive to the Lord. Okay, You're here because you deeply care about your relationship with the Lord, right? You want it to develop. You want it to thrive. And you know the stumbling we do in life, do you guys ever sin? Who sinned today? Listen, when you sin, when you stumble, and your heart is for the Lord, it doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. i got to tell you something about the work of Christ, that what he did on the cross, that the, that the, the security of the salvation we have is not about the, your ability to perform or fail along the way. The security of our salvation has always been about the quality and the supremacy of the sacrifice that was offered for us. Amen? All glory be to God for that one. It's the quality of the sacrifice now listen, this world is not a secure place. Would you agree? 
Uh, sometimes we have failing health. Uh, relationships can disintegrate. Uh, money can dwindle just like that. But God wants you to know in this world we live where it's shaky ground, where it's not secure, that we can live in a place of security. We can live in a place of confidence in him. You know, one thing that is, that is certain in this life, and that's that this life is not secure. However, we can find security in the quality of the sacrifice we have in Jesus Christ. Now, someone once said, I didn't realize that God was all I needed until I came to the place that God was all I had. Now, listen, we need to understand that sometimes health fades, money dwindles, relationships can disintegrate. But through it all, we can still have confidence in life because we're secure in him. I write these things so that you will know when all things may be shifting sands, you can have the security of knowing you're going to be with me for eternity. That's an important thing for us to know as Christians. Amen? You know, some people think, geez, if I just had a lot of money, if I just was rich and famous, that would be the answer to my problems. Have you ever thought that? If I was just rich and famous. I like what Jim Carrey said. Jim Carrey said, I wish everybody had the opportunity to be rich beyond their wildest dreams and famous and be able to do whatever they want, whenever they want, just so they could discover that ain't the answer. <laughs> I love it. He says, I wish that they could have that, all that they've ever dreamed of, so they could see that that's not the answer. Listen, the answer is this, is that we need God. And you don't have to wait until your whole world is falling apart before you figure out that that's exactly who you need. Amen? John said this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of Jesus Christ so that you may know that you have eternal life. What is he talking about? He's talking about the assurance of our salvation. I would not want to be a part of one of these works-based religions, which there's a lot of them out there, okay? Because how would you ever know, did I do enough stuff that if I die during the night while I'm trying to sleep and I don't wake up in the morning, did I do enough to be able to go to heaven? But God says, you don't have to live that way because the assurance of your salvation is not in what you do. It's what I've already done for you. I write these things to you who believe. Believe in what? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God who came in the flesh and he went to a cross, not for his sin, but for ours? They put him in a tomb. And three days later, he came busting out. Do you believe that what he did was the payment for everything you ever did wrong? Then guess what? He's writing to you. He's writing to those who believe. Believe what? The gospel message. I'm writing to those of you who believe so that you will know that you have eternal life. So what are the things that he wrote about? Well, he wrote things like this. God loves you. He died for you. Your sins are forgiven. And you know, it's uh, in the love that your father has for you that you can have security. Amen? You have assurance that this salvation you have, it's a real deal. Now, there's another thing he talks about a little further on in that, that God wants you to know that he hears your prayers. Have you ever wondered if God hears your prayers? Well, he does. And God wants you to know that he hears your prayers. 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. Would you read it with me? If anyone asks anything according to his will, he hears us. Let's read the underline again. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have what we ask of him. So has wondering whether or not it was God's will or not prevented you from praying? Has that ever, I'm not sure if this is God's will or not, so I'm kind of holding back because I don't know. Well, listen to this. God is all-knowing. Is that true? He sees everything. He understands everything. Do we? No. And so what that means is sometimes we may pray things that ultimately aren't God's will for us. And so he will answer that prayer, but that prayer, the answer is often no. That's his answer there. How many of you remember when your kids were young and they would ask for all kinds of things that weren't good for them? Right? Steve, you know, your wife was in the hospital. Praise God, she's at home now. And I know people have been coming around and getting meals for you. But for four days, your kids were saying, Dad, can we have pizza? And for four days, they had pizza. (laughs) Listen. Our kids will ask for all kinds of things. Can I have ice cream for dinner? Can I have a Hershey bar for dinner? You know, they'll ask for all kinds of things. And we as parents, we know something they don't know. That every now and again, they ask for things that aren't good for them. And so out of our love and care for them, we don't give them the things that aren't good for them. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's exactly the way God responds. In the same way he hears your prayers, they are filtered through the heart of a loving father. And when we're praying those things that are God's will, we can be confident he's going to release those things. And likewise, when we're praying things that are counter to God's will, he's not going to release those things. Now, I this is a story from when I was young and You know, sometimes after I tell these stories, my wife says, you needed to be more clear about time frame. This wasn't something you did last week, okay? This wasn't something you did last month. This is is before I ever met. I was a kid, okay? And I remember there was this um, pretty girl in my school. And I said, dear God, would you please make her fall in love with me? She didn't. Now, do we, do we pray prayers kind of like that still? You're going, no. <laughs> God, help me win the lottery. You ever buy a lottery ticket and pray, dear God, help me win? Okay. One time I was asking the Lord about it. I said, Lord, why aren't you answering these prayers? prayers. I'm praying that she'd fall in love with me and she doesn't even know I'm alive. Why are you answering my prayer? And the Lord says, well, how about you stop asking for stones and snakes? I went, what do you mean by that? And then I read this verse. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you know how to give good good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And the Lord says, the thing you're asking for is not a good thing for you. That's why my answer is no. See, God wants you to know he does listen to your prayers. He hears those prayers. And when we ask for things that aren't his desire or would be harmful for us, out of his loving heart of a father, he simply responds with a no. He simply responds with a no. Now, that's one thing that happens there is is, uh, that right there. But the other one is sometimes we just simply don't ask for enough. We're sitting there asking God for a PB&J, and God's saying, why don't you ask for more? I got a T-bone sitting on the Barbie and you're praying for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. There's so much more that I have for you. I'm willing to give so much, but you ask for so little. And often we're getting bogged down with things like, God, I really need a new iPhone. And God's saying, 
Really? Come on, guys. Think big. You're praying for an iPhone. How about asking to wake up tomorrow morning full of life, energy, vitality, with, with, with a vibrance and a kick in your step because you understand the purpose and the plan I have for you, that you can go out and live the life of a world changer. Why don't you pray for something big? You're hung up on iPhones, and why don't you pray for something big? See, so often that's where we're at. We're waiting for God to answer our prayers, but we need to understand God will give you what's good for you, but the other thing that can tr truncate that is simply not asking or asking too small. So therefore, if we understand the heart of our Father is that he is gracious, kind, loving, and compassionate, why not pray big prayers? Amen? Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord applause for that one. So what would be a big prayer for you? Think about that. Maybe write that one on your notes right, right now on your outline. What would be a big prayer? Write that down, and I double dog dare you to start praying for some big stuff. Amen? The last thing is this. God wants you to know that you really can change. You really can. It's possible. 1 John 5, 18, verse 20. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. Now, do you guys remember when we read a couple of weeks ago? He kind of answered that question. He says, why is that? Because God's seed is in him. Now, what happens with the seed? It takes time. So this isn't meant to, for you to evaluate, am I saved or not? It's really for you to see where are you in the process of, of maturing in Christ. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. Now, would you read this underlined with me? This is so good. I've not heard this portion preached on spiritual warfare. I'm looking forward to another sermon down the road on spiritual warfare, and I'm going to preach this one right here. You guys ready? The one who was born of God keeps him safe. Keeps who safe? Who's the him? Us keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. Hallelujah. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Verse 20, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And read this with me, and we are in him who is true true we are in him okay now a few weeks ago we used the word abide okay abiding in him we are fully connected with christ we are connected we are living in the one who is true even his son jesus christ he is the true god and eternal life now listen last week i talked about how we really are in a battle it's not a battle against human beings. It's not a battle against flesh and blood. It's not Democrat versus Republican or conservative versus liberal. It's none of that, okay? No, that's not the battle. The battle is a spiritual battle. But we need to understand in that battle that Jesus Christ keeps us safe from the evil one. That's incredible, amen? What an, what an amazing message. And then John began his letter early on, uh, you know, 1 John chapter 1. He says, if anyone says that they don't sin, they are lying. They're lying. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Then in chapter 3, he says what? That God's seed is in you. I just talked about that. When a seed is planted, it takes some time for that seed to grow and develop you are being transformed but keep in mind that transformation process is from glory to glory okay he goes on in this book 
He says we're going to continue to grow. His life is at work in you. And that you can begin to win the war over sin. You can begin to win, but it's a process. Now, you may not win every battle, but you should begin to win. There may be certain areas of your life where it takes perhaps years. It may take the rest of your life for you to feel like you're really starting to gain victory over some of those things. Some of those habits, some of those old ways of thinking, they can be so deeply rooted that we find ourselves tripping up over them for years to come. But the fact is we should be at least gaining some victory over those things. And the hope we have in Christ is that one day we will see him face to face and we will become like him because we will see him as he is. It's through the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit that true transformation takes place. Amen? So 1 John was written because there are some important things that God wants you to know. What are some things he wants you to know? That you can be forgiven. Can you say hallelujah for that? He wants you to know who you are in Christ. He wants you to know that you are secure in the love God has for you and the relationship you can have with him, that you belong to him. He wants you to know that he considers you his child, that he loves you, that he hears your prayer, and that he protects you in the midst of the spiritual battle, and you actually can overcome the evil one in Jesus' name. Amen? Those are important things to know. I'm going to ask if we can go ahead and pray together. Lord, as we come before you this morning, there's some things we need to know. And I pray, God, that our hearts would be fertile, that it would be fertile soil so that when the seeds of your word are deposited on our hearts, and Lord, the, the, the rain of your Holy Spirit and the sunshine of your love and the fertilizer of your word, Lord, would cause there to be rapid growth and change and transformation in our lives. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Listen, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never asked him into your life. Maybe you have at some point in the past, but you've just kind of wandered away from him. And if that's you, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to him. Go ahead and raise your hand if that's you. Either you're committing or recommitting to the Lord. Could you raise your hand high where you're at right now? Okay, I didn't see any hands today. But listen, if that's something you're wanting to do, you can just settle that between you and the Lord. You can just simply say yes to him. And Lord, I pray that we would be understanding more and more the outrageous love you have for us. And Lord, that love would be transforming. Lord, that love would change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen.